This week on The Breakdown, the ABs have locked down the bled as low with a game to spare and in record fashion. We hear of starting debutant Hoskins, the Tutu size 13s have come back to earth yet. Bashi catches up with Mertz and Sydney, thank goodness we're not paying by the word, and Tum by Mertzins in studio. The player turn coach, turn code breaker, unpacks the big match for us. Can't wait. Kia ora koutou, kato, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. It is great to be back with you. And yes, the All Blacks have locked up the Bledisloe Cup for the 19th straight year with a dominant performance in Sydney. The question is, how will the Wallabies respond or will the All Blacks show no mercy? Our breakdown team, I'm fired up tonight, team. I really am. I've got plenty to talk about. I took a week off and I've come back here now. And I tell you what, I've got a lot to say about a lot of things, but I want you guys to go first. But your reaction, Mills, you weren't with us on Saturday night. You were sitting at home enjoying the test match. <laughs> OK, run us through what you were thinking as they were running all over this Wallabies team. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, on reflection now, before you guys start getting a little bit negative, I loved it. I love the fact, and your, your point about saying that the 19th time that we've won the Bledders Low Cup, they haven't had it for 19 years, so before we get to the nitty-gritty stuff, I absolutely enjoyed how we dealt with them, JK. Totally agree with you, Mills. It was outstanding to see the smiles on the players' faces. You know, it is a really, really important thing for, to win... Foster comes in, puts that on the cards. But Aussie were woeful. <laughs> and the referee, what the hell was going on with that decision? I couldn't believe it. Which one? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> so in the World Cup, it would have been a red card. Now, yellow card was the... Oh, no. Nah. OK. So do you want me to keep going? No, or? we're, we're going to get going. We're going to keep going, Burn. But I mean, for you, you, oh. you're in here working with us. Spat going, on you, oh, <laughs> we expected more absolutely. out of this contest. Yeah, absolutely. Look, first of all, lovely to have back, Jeff. Um, but yeah, I was sitting in here with JK, and I'm so glad they didn't take his advice. And it was basically, don't come out of the change rooms at halftime. Stay there. You're woeful. It was an absolute down trial. It's not great to see for the Aussies. The big question is, where on earth do they go to from here? Well, for me, it's more about the fact that where was the pride in the jersey? But more importantly... I'm really disappointed and frustrated about... They had the opportunity to have 40,000 fans. The NRL final got 40,000. It was full. 18,000, just over 18,000 turn up for this. For me, Sanzar here have failed. And I don't think New Zealand rugby are responsible in any way, shape or form. Because we had a tournament planned to have it here in New Zealand with fans. We could have done that and we could have actually delivered not just to our, our fans, to the fans across the Southern Hemisphere, across the globe, a united, I suppose, an atmosphere. And in the end, the Wallabies probably would have been better off because they played better in New Zealand than they did at home, Mills. And to me, I think they have failed the fans in this case because too many people have missed out. Oh, absolutely. I, I would love to know what, what the heck has gone on because, you know, it wasn't as if, you know, the, the two games in New Zealand was a write-off that, that we were that dominant, you know. And all of, the, all of a sudden, we go over to Australia and there's, what, 18 on 1,000 1, fans. So... Where did the 40,000... Well, go? and who's coming this I'll weekend? I'll yeah. tell you what's happened. I will tell you exactly what happened. There's a power game going on somewhere. Will. Now, they used, they used New Zealand to start with saying they're arrogant. This is the politicians. They're arrogant. And then Hamish comes on our show and says this and that, and then we're going to pay for it, so, so Queensland's going to play, blah, blah, blah. But they did not put the game first. The game should have been here. We could have had... Argentina versus Australia and Hawke's Bay, it would have been full. So I think, once again, politics has got in the way of what's the right thing for the game. And, and it's worst case scenario, who does it best serve, Jeff? I mean, yeah. you think about how's that going to inspire the next wave of Wallaby, the next wave of kid who wants to play rugby union? It's not going to do that at all. And why in the world are we playing them again straight away? But the fact that we play them back to back and then we've got Argentina and then a break to their second test against them. The fact that this, this tri nations they've put together, South Africa, who obviously had a major vote in where this has gone, they're not even here. And JK, we talked about it. The contingency plans, if something was to happen, we asked on this show and nothing burn was done. The fact no one got the invitation. If they did, they weren't interested enough to come. No one else had the opportunity to do what we were able to do. I think and I believe that, well and truly, this sends our partnership. Mills, for me, it's dead and buried. It's well, done. Well, I mean, the fact that South Africa had such a big say and then they didn't even turn up, that's probably saying something in terms of the politics that you were talking about, JK. 
Uh, th this is what upsets me, Mills. I mean, we hear about the Pacific nations, we hear this, we should be doing this, doing that. But the reality was, we said on the show, forget about Sanzar this year. Yeah. Do what's right for the game. Mm -hmm. Fly teams down in private jets, England, France, whatever, play them down here. Even if they want to play Six Nations, bring Fiji. Fiji have got COVID and they're in France. <laughs> Lucky yeah. They could be come. here safe. I mean, what <laughs> yeah. are we thinking? And these are, these, are, these are the points to me which are incredibly frustrating, Burn. You know, the fact we had that opportunity, but... Also, the fact on the weekend, it, it wasn't free of controversy and there was stuff on the field oh. which, I know, which fired everyone so up in here. So much, so much. Oh, I tell you what. We had to go to the law book. Or the, <laughs> Google came out, Mr Google. Didn't we? we I everywhere. think the TMO's got a lot to answer for, doesn't he? But, I mean, look, Fozzie was relieved. That was the way we described him. And, and Dave Rennie, he was absolutely gutted, wasn't he? One member of the Aussie media was even quoted as saying that at half-time, they flicked over to watch the Queensland state elections. There was more chance of seeing blood and sweat on that. They went on to say that the best part was the indigenous juicies, which were fabulous, by the way, and the fact that um, if you can't win, at least you can look pretty doing it. So that's just a snapshot of the Aussie media. They're mocking their own team. Um, but new footage has been released of the Aussie team and how they were going to try and tackle, should I say, the All Blacks. So um, you'd have to say the tackle bag perhaps was the safest thing on the park, and they clearly wore themselves out in training. Because Mills, we can put fashion. shoulder pads on like that and still do that, right? Yeah, I mean, when you know someone's going to run straight at you. Yeah, exactly, and it doesn't look like they're going for sort of full noise as well. I mean, that, I mean, without knowing the context of what the drill was about, it just didn't look like it was sort of 100. percent That's what you've got to do that at. And, and no truth to the rumour that uh, Owen Farrell was uh, helping refine their tackle technique. But um, surely the biggest winning margin between the Aussies and All Blacks is it's thirsty work, and I think Sam Kane really deserved a brown fizzy. He said he was going to have a fizzy after the game, and so nice seeing him picking up the big cup and enjoying. The efforts of his work. What do you mean? 42 cans, was it, Jeff? That holds? 42, you said? It's a buffalo. It's a <laughs> Can it's you call a buffalo on that? It's a buffalo. Can it's you? Tough, tough finish. But I'll tell you what, what though. I, I mean, JK, you've seen it uh, full uh, as much as we have. I mean, it's, uh, it's not an easy challenge. Must but be it's a beautiful just, thing to drink out what, of. It was nice to see them celebrate it, particularly straight after the game. You know, the, the energy they brought to it and that showed as well. There's maybe a little bit of desperation in the fact that they wanted to, to point a proof. I mean, I think the disappointing for all of us was that the Aussie-Australian team showed so much promise in the first couple of games. You know, even the test at Eden Park was relatively good, and then they come out with a performance like that. And let's just hope it's a speed bump and they continue to get better. I don't know, I said this, the honeymoon's over, you know, for Dave Rennie, because it is, because I don't know what he's going to do this week at 10. Um, you know, the interesting thing for me, though, is the pressure now, Mills, on an all-black team after 19 years, you don't want to be the person to lose it. So that relief on the weekend Absolutely. was palpable. It was beautiful to watch, you know. Fozzie smiling, Sam Kane, first time as captain, mm. and you retain it. You go, oh... It was you relief, know? wasn't it? It was a relief. And, and having a drink out of the bleeders, though, must be a beautiful thing. Um, like drinking out of the, the World Cup, but the, the Webb Alice Trophy hasn't quite got the same, I don't know... Volume, perhaps? Faf, put some pants on. I mean, now that's not a cup, is it? I know it means a little more, but... I know, Bernie, that's, that's a cup. On so many yeah. levels. Yeah. That's that. a cup. You want to drink out of that, <laughs> even if it holds half a thumble. Yeah, look, it was, that's a that's shot disturbing. glass. Disturbing. That's a shot glass. That's, that's spillage, too. That's, that's for our totally wasteful. Friends, right? That's for our South African friends. Yeah, we a year them. ago. We a missed year them. ago. We miss you guys. Can you believe it was a year ago? Anyway, when we talk about staying humble and enjoying yourself, um, Rico Ioane, he was absolutely stoked to touch down, actually touch down this time and find the chalk. Um, and he also got to do his trademark little dive in the process. But, you know, the haters on Instagram that was, you know, giving him a bit of grief because he, he fumbled that one. Well, he had the perfect comeback, I think. Have a look at this and see what you think. Read the caption. You ain't one of the haters, though, <laughs> Bernadine. You're not one of the haters down <laughs> I, the bottom there. Were you it. the first person to I like liked it? Or what? I might have been the first or the last. Kind regards, said Rico Ioani. And that was his comeback, basically saying, There you go, I've done it. And, and I, I thought it was funny at the time. You kind I would have if I knew how to like something on Instagram. Well, I, 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 I find it interesting with the fact there were two tries in that game that didn't get scored in the corners with covering defence coming across. You know all about that corner. Yeah, well, uh, it's a different stadium, but it's still a damn Yeah, uh, but you corner. still know about the corner. Yeah, I still know about cover defence. <laughs> um, we all know it's not that funny, to be honest. It's not that funny at all. I do want to talk about some sort of controversy, JK, and this is for you because I know you're up in arms about... How would you say interference, maybe, from um, Angus Gardner and the TMO on the weekend, particularly early on in the game? And we, we think no, no, about... no, hang on. Interference, throwing your mate under the bus, and you were wrong. It made him look when... silly, didn't it? It actually made O'Keefe look silly. It's throwing your mate under the bus. 
He's made a decision. Have we got it? You've got to listen to this, people. Again, I could not believe this. I mean, this is a try. If you read the, if you read the rules, downward motion, boom, done. Every day of the week. You look at that twice. Listen. No, I'm happy with the grounding. I'm happy with the grounding. <coughs> I'm going to try. For you, Mills, is it time then, when that decision is made right, just play on? It's... Yeah, well, I think it's, it's come about because we've been so caught up in technology. I think now's the time now you've got to actually try and pull back. He's, you've, you've, you've got to back the referee in this scenario. Now, let's put it in a, in a way where if he had, had he got it wrong and given that, that try, he would be thrown under the bus. But they've got, to, they've got to take responsibility of that, whether they're wrong or, 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 or right. I think you give him the opportunity to go, hey, mate, you've, you've done it, you've made a decision on the field. But if it comes out that he is wrong, well, that's when they've got to come out and say, well, that was, that was wrong at the moment. They got it wrong, Still but they, no one's come out. Still not enough clarity around the process, JK. Oh, but it's ridiculous that they showed it 350 million times <laughs> afterwards. You throw your mate under the bus, you get it wrong. And then the other thing is that he is now going to second-guess himself every time he's got a solid decision. Mm -hmm. And that's what annoyed me. And if we go back to the yellow card, which I thought was the right decision, but they changed that rule, right, on the TMO being able to come in last August, which I found out about half an hour ago. And last year they said, if you take someone out in the air, red card. So we've got all this happening in the game. At least come out and say, got it wrong. And next time, don't throw your mate But that's the, the thing, bus. though. They aren't clear-cut on what the rule, ruling actually that's right. is. There's, di there's different uh, interpretations from, from both referees, and that's where the, the whole confusion comes about because there's so many different interpretations. I think there's a lot of things that everyone can learn from this game, whether it be organisations running at an event or getting the opportunity to do so or the referees coming out of it. But at the same token, it was a magnificent performance from both uh, the All Blacks and their bench and their coaching staff. We shouldn't forget about them as well. Well, we've got a presence over there in Sky in Australia. They are committed to the cause, well, we think they are. Let's get some post-match commentary from Marshall and Mertens. Well, I guess living here has given you the opportunity to have a foot in both camps. You were working um, with the Aussies on the weekend and a few Wallaby legends were involved. What, what was their initial reaction to that result? Was it a, a poor Aussie performance? Was it a very good All Black one? How were they feeling about the game? Well, I think they, they do take their hats off to the All Blacks, um, particularly over the last 12, 15 years, that the high standards that have been set. I know we've got a great history with the All Blacks for, you know, decades and decades, but certainly the last 12 or 15 years, the consistency of the excellence of performance. So I think they're kind of resigned to, you know, if the All Blacks turn up at the moment, um, they're going to win. They, they're, they're a better team. But there's still the hope there that Australia can be on a, an upward curve. I think they were disappointed. There were glimmers of hope in that first test in Wellington. Probably didn't help some of the hyperbole that came out of Australia after that, as if, like, gee, we're on the brink of something and, you know, um, we're, we're about to go smash the All Blacks. So that, that probably didn't help. But the last couple of weeks, I think they've just applauded, a, you know, really, really ruthless, um, accurate, um, simple All Black performances. And, and I suppose they want to focus on themselves and just say, look, we, we hope the Wallabies get a lot better. We know there's a, a big gulf there um, and, and we need to get a lot better. For all of their praise, I guess, and, and how good the All Blacks are, I also chatted to the sub, uh, some of them after the game who were reasonably outspoken tactically about some of the things the Wallabies did on the night. And, and one of those things was uh, young Lola Seal putting him back at fullback. Did, did they get that wrong? Yeah, well, well, I mean, when you look at the Richie Moonga try, and that was absolutely brilliant, a, a superb individual effort from uh, Moonga. But, you know, that, it wasn't good defence, um, neither on the short side from the, the, the forwards trying to cover that, nor from Lolly Sierra playing it at fullback. They'll, he'll be disappointed. I've been in that position before from 10 where you get put back. I wasn't a, a strong defender, obviously, um, and got put back at fullback to cover the back there for the kicks and, I guess, thump it back down there straight away <laughs> before you could get a chance to get your mitts on it. Um, so I, I don't like it. I'd rather, I mean, when you grow up playing 10, even if you're not a strong defender, you, you're part of the system and you know that the system uh, better than you do it at fullback, I guess. So, you know, it was tough and it also makes you feel like there's there's no confidence in you at all. Um, the difference was when I did it, most of the time it was someone like Leon McDonald who was defending up at 10 and he knows how to defend at 10. I'm not convinced, you know, you should be putting a Dane Haylett Petty up in the front line. He's a really good fullback defender. So, yeah, I think they probably got that wrong, but it certainly didn't wasn't the th one thing that cost them the game, you know. I mean, it was a very comprehensive all-black performance. Speaking of the all-blacks, um, you know, obviously that, that was a very good 
in particular first half performance and then they sort of got into a little bit of a scrap in the second half where it became disjointed but when they when they struck they were lethal weren't they still room for improvement though do you think well I wouldn't say there's much room for improvement from that first half the All Blacks will look at it and say of course there are there'll, there'll be certain things they they will know that you know even when they got the ball and, and kept recycling it there might have been clean outs that they wouldn't be happy with accuracy wise so despite the result they'll be looking at the process I'm sure they'll find things they can improve but gee in the conditions that there were with the slippery ball and the, 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 the quality of the handling the quality of the timing uh, it was just so impressive and it, very hard after 40 minutes like that to maintain that same intensity that same um, accuracy I think so you know Australia started the second half really well tried it all See a great run from Pattaya, um, but then the All Blacks, I guess, tightened up again and, and sort of said, let's not let this this Australian team back into it and get their confidence up. So, yeah, not much improvement they can do. I'm sure they'll find things, like I say, but, uh, gee, it was, it was amazing to watch. Just very briefly, would you make any changes if you were Ian Foster for this weekend at Suncorp? You know, maybe look at Barrett at first five and um, Geordie back at fullback, something like that, or do you think they'll wait to Argentina? I'm struggling with uh, the meaning of the word briefly. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th- I, th- I don't think he'll change too much. Foster, but it is an opportunity to, to I think, probably give Satutu another go as well in dry conditions as well. I thought he went really, really well, but obviously, you know, the drier the conditions, it, it suits him from playing in the, in the blues. We saw the, the skills that he's got, so I think we'll give him more experience. Um, maybe a couple more changes. That's been the beauty of the All Blacks, I guess, in the last 15 years, that the depth and the competition they've got across, across the group, they're able to just, you know, put two or three guys in here and there, get them some experience without changing too much and, and get them into a well-oiled machine. So I don't think we'll see too much. And they certainly won't want to drop their standards up in Brisbane by, by having lots of changes and, and, and sort of new combinations. So um, was that brief? Yeah, that was very brief. <laughs> For me. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, there you have it, team. Um, it must be early in the morning because I think that's the most serious the two of us has ever been in an interview. Easiest chat, Andrew Mertens. Going to ask two or three questions and away he goes. Interesting, he was thinking, though, about the All Blacks not making too many changes. We're thinking maybe it's time to do that. John Plumtree's already said, I think, today out of Australia, they are going to make some. We're going to talk about some guys we'd like to see get an opportunity. I'm going to kick it off. I'd like to see Will Jordan get to play because he's been put on ice. I think it's time for him to get back out and start playing some footy. Look, he was irresistible in Super Rugby Aotearoa and there are some things I really like about his game. We've seen that Geordie Barrett is well and truly good enough at the next level. Uh, we've also obviously got lots of depth. George Bridge is out injured now. Severy Reese is available. But I'd like to see him on the right wing. Ease him into Test Match footy, footy Mills. If that's the case for me on the wing, who have you got at fullback? I, I think I'd, I'd shift Barrett, you know, back there, um, you know, uh, Geordie Barrett, that is, and then put McKenzie on the bench to cover, you know, 10 and uh, 10 and 15. Are so. you expecting changes? Then? Look, I really like the way Rico Ioane looked uh, on the wing. Looked really, really sharp for me, JK. You're shaking your head once again. Are you thinking they might shift him back to centre? I'll quickly do my team. Moody Taylor, Offer, Whitelock, Barrett, Frizzell, Popoli'i, Savia, <laughs> Perinara, Barrett, <laughs> Reese, Ioane, Anton Leonard Brown, Jordan Barrett, done. Thank you. Seven changes with Dalton Popoli uh, out so, there. Uh, someone's really been on the about. phone. Someone's been on the phone. But I tell you what then, OK, Dalton Popoli'i then you're seeing as the open side flanker. Adi Savia is available for selection this week. What does that mean for Sam Kane? No, Sam Kane needs a rest. I and think this be, is the replacement. This is the replacement at seven, Why? I believe. Adi at eight. We know Hoskins is going to be good. Give him a rest. Start him against Adi. He's Argentina. only played, started one game. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, he's been a young man, he's a bit tired. Popoli, I, I loved his energy when he came on on the weekend. I think he's a really honest replacement. If something does happen to Kane, get him out there. So is that the physicality you're looking for? Is that different to what Adi Savia brings? Yes, it's different. This guy's the workhorse. Frizzell's going to bring the physicality and keep growing into the Jerome Kaino-esque person that we want. Right? Savia at eight, him at seven. Maybe Hoskins on the bench to cover all three. Shannon Frizzell's made some big moves oh, in the last couple of games and big shifts. For you, you're liking, though, another option on the blindside flank. And does that impact a, a starting spot or off the bench? I think you give him off the bench. I think, uh, you know, Cullen Grace, the way he's sort of played his super rugby and the physicality he brings, but also, um, you know, his, his ability to be able to play at lock, defensive um, as well, you know, to, to throw him up there and try and win some defensive ball. I think you give him a taste on the bench. I think we grow that momentum in terms of our locking department and also our Lucy's. Give him a taste of what Test Match Rugby's all about, but most importantly, what the preparation is like during that whole that whole week. And I think you grow, you grow the, our, our young Lucy's in that way. Well, for me, it's about World Cup. 
We want to. We've we've got the Bledisloe in the cupboard. We've got to see some of these guys at this level. The, the interesting thing for selectors on a serious note is how do you find that balance, you know? I'd love to play Hoskins, but if you can have some young guys out there, right. possibly Sevilla with Popoli and Frizzell, you've got enough experience. Whitelock and Barrett, three Barretts on the field. But I think that's the balance we've got. If, I mean, look at, you look at the Australian and how sort of inexperienced their team is. We're not sitting here going, make changes and, and don't worry about because if we lose or not, this is an all-black team that's going to go out there and win. We've easily got two, two teams that can go out there. So you're prepared to take risks this week? I think, you give, you, I, I think that we've got a good enough team, if we did make those seven or eight changes, that we can go out there and still beat the Wallabies. And that's probably the, the confidence that the coaches will have. One really interesting thing that I cannot believe is happening, and it goes back to our early discussion, and I don't know if you know this at home, the All Blacks have to fly up on the day of the game and then fly back on the day of the game. I don't think that's ever happened in a Test match. So, Mills, you know what that's like. So a couple of times we got the super teams to fly out straight after the game. You lose those games because it's very, very hard, you know, to actually have a day like that where you're flying. That's incredible. And... The, the other side of it for me is is who they choose to give a break. If you're making that change at fullback, does that mean Bowden Barrett shifts forward to 10? Do you play Aaron Smith or do you give him a week off remembering we have Argentina a week later? So whether or not some of those guys who have played a lot of test matches, is it time for Brad Weber to get his opportunity? I'll tell you what, I can't wait to see this team because if it's got the talent we're talking about, we've all waited for the performances. to Akira Iwani. Got to remember how good he was. We're going to talk about him a little bit later after the break. We look back and we get deeper into the game with Tabai Matson. But one player would love to see back in action this weekend and, and was that probably our very best in Bledisloe 3, Richie Moonga. <laughs> Kia welcome back to the breakdown. After the weekend, there were some standout players and performances, and with the help of coach and tactical genius, Tabai Matson, he was with me in the war room. It's time for us to look deeper into the game. We're going to talk analytics with you, and you're with us for the next month or so, and I want you to talk to us straight away. What, what are the analytics for you? What does analysis mean, and how do you go about it, and what's relevant? We, we were actually talking before the test match on Saturday how when you start off as a coach, there's just so many numbers. Um, it's nearly over-analysis, lots of numbers that eventually you figure out are really irrelevant. And so analysis or analytics is really about answering questions that coaches want to ask and trying to objectify some of the, the grey stuff, the invisible stuff in the game. Didn't they call it paralysis by analysis? They did. Which, I mean, <laughs> when it first... It did, they did, because when I first started studying the games, the, 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 like, the team that made the most errors was winning the game. It's, it's a contrast, yeah. but... Because basically they're playing more football, right? But tell me this, Tabs, like what is the difference between analytics and stats? Because if you get lost in the stats, yeah. you just go nuts. So what, what is the analytics? What, do you pour it down a funnel or what do you yeah, do? Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. There's a, a much smarter guy, Simon Chi, in Calgary University who kind of does the analytics for us. But it's really about taking, it's kind of KPIs versus analytics. So KPIs, as you said, like... These are the raw things a team's doing. It's making tackles. But actually, at the end of the day, it still loses. So the analytics that you'll see us talking about over the next month is around, does this action change the scoreboard? And I think that's a really important differentiation. Does this impact the team's ability to get their scoreboard ticking over? And there are critical parts of the game that you've identified, and, and, and they change from week to week. But this week, we're focusing on six of them, which, in terms of the analytics, are critical for that team performance and the effect it has on the scoreboard. And, and these are those six. Yep. So the big six, and we've kind of added one from the um, test match on Saturday, scrum and line out, always a critical set piece. Starter, special plays, the defence, the kicking game, which we talk, talk, spoke about on Saturday, and the importance that the Wallabies didn't get it right and the impact it had around the turnovers. Um, and, of course, phase attack. You know, what are the default plays for the Wallabies and the, um, and the All Blacks and how they can either hold the ball or put the teams under pressure. And so what we're going to focus on, one of those, and the ones you've added, um, is, is the turnovers and, and the attack efficiency and something the All Blacks have been very good at for a long, long time. But 
We've seen in the, in the Rugby Championship this year. What do these stats mean? How has this played out? What does it mean for the people at home? Yeah. Before we start, can I just understand what a turnover is? Because most of the people I talk to think of turnovers in the ruck. Yeah. Is it only in the ruck no. or no? no? So with regard to these numbers, the turnovers with any time the opposition cough up the ball to you. So it might be a line out you've won off, off their throw. Um, if a player just drops it, uh, and also, you know, traditional, traditional jackal, we win the ball and a breakdown, we move it on. If you look at the stats here, though, that would bring those on is the fact that you look over the last three years, the fact that what has happened through the Rugby Championship, the All Blacks' efficiency of turnovers has changed significantly. Yeah. From one out of every four times we get it, we score, to just 14% to 4.8%. And that, that's a significant marker. And is that how you use the statistics to find red flags yeah. so as a coach you can ask the right questions? Yeah, absolutely. Often when we reflect on the game, whether it be... Um, the last month's games, our memory is often wrong, and what analytics gives you is actually objective data to go, actually, I thought that was happening, but it's not. Or in this case here for the All Blacks, there's been a, a, a definite change of trend around something we were world class at, uh, and it was, it was and, important on the weekend. And Mills, quite often though, that can change with coaches, right? Absolutely. When the focus changes, all of a sudden the time spent on field focusing on different parts can change and maybe the All Blacks have looked at some things differently, had the same coaching staff for a long time. Do you think that maybe will be something we will see through the numbers? Oh, different trends, absolutely. Personnel as well, you know, different coaches, you know, like different things and for instance, you know, Wayne Smith loved the click plays and, and that's what you're talking about, the, the actual turnovers yeah. and how you get yourself into, into transitioning into those sort of plays. And you called them click plays and we've uh, looked at a couple from uh, the weekend, the way both teams uh, found an opportunity when opposition makes mistake, mistakes tabs, and the Wallabies did it, and the All Blacks did it just here. Turn the ball over, all of a sudden there's an opportunity to break, and then it's a broken defensive line. Yeah. Geordie Barrett strikes it. And how much of that uh, is, is learned and trained tabs as a team? I think everything is, is, is learned and trained. And like, you know, JK around resources in the game, like, you get what you get at training. So if you're focusing on this, you'll get it on Saturdays. So, but, but I hear often, play what's in front of you. So is this a situation where a click play yep. from you a turnover over. like this you've seen, Tabs, maybe you can explain this to us. And that's one of the things, even for the Wallabies, they've got really outstanding outside backs. Patea and the wingers, their ability to get the ball from unstructured play, the All Blacks have turned it over, move it into a wide channel. And, and why is Smithy quarter to click play? You, you have a look, it's your ability to be able to click into you know, offensively, you know, look up in front of you and see where there's a mismatch there. But on the flip side of that too, being able to get into click play and how you organise your defence, and you looked in that scenario there, the All, the, the all Blacks don't organise, and, and then all of a sudden, quick ball, and they adjust to that as well. So, over, and, and over they go. That's how massive click plays are, and, and turnover ball. Yeah. So, when you say click play, so click play is the, the turnover, and what you would coach the players right there is to read what's in front of them both on attack and defence. So they've got to look up very quickly, see the space, and communicate it as fast as possible. I and mean, that's something, when you look at the All Blacks, I mean, is that something that we can now look at and continue to look at? And, we, and we're sitting at home, we're going, you know what, how do we react to that? Because maybe, Tabai, maybe last year, was the, with this focus on developing a way of breaking down the rush defence, did we maybe... Because there's only X number of hours in a week, right? Yeah. In training week as a coach. How important is that structure in terms of developing these skills and these click plays, these abilities? To... How do you see our skill sets compared to other teams around the world? Uh, it's, it's not. An, I don't think it's a natural um, propensity for us to do it. I think all the teams understand that actually turning over the ball and trying to strike within five or six seconds of getting the ball back is a really dangerous point of attack. For me, the analytics is interesting because... It's changed leading into the World Cup, and it, it, it's really a flag to say, hey, if this is really important, how much of the training week or our resources will we put towards this? Because we saw in the test match in uh, the weekend, or and even the first test and the second test, turnovers, tries. And is that team and individual? Because we're talking about a Absolutely, team, right? It's yeah. collective. And the same analytics is going into the individual now? Yes. Okay. So we can do that, and we're going to look in depth to one of the All Blacks who played incredibly well on the weekend. Hoskins Satutu started his first test, and Kirsty Stanway had the opportunity to catch up with him today in Australia. What's it like being an All Black? What's it like coming into this environment for the very first time? Um, I think it's pretty intimidating, like uh, coming in first time, you know, like uh, pretty fresh and stuff. But um, I think the boys have made me feel quite welcome, and um, it's been a pretty, well, I wouldn't say easy, but it's pretty nice to slot in and, yeah, fit in pretty well. 
Who's taken you under their wing since you've sort of come in? Has there um, been a few players? Yeah, there's been a few. Um, Sam Sam Keane's looked after me quite well. Artie as well. Just um, all those uh, older heads have all been pretty pretty nice to me, as, especially and. Um, yeah, pretty easy to talk to, I guess. Not too scary. Was there ever any thought that maybe you would line up for Fiji or for England? Um, oh, to be honest, it was sort of like in the back of my head, like sort of second option. I just knew it was like, oh, I could do them if I uh, didn't get picked because there's always massive talent in New Zealand, obviously. But yeah, lucky enough to you know, get the nod and put my put the black jersey on. Let's talk about um, growing up then. How big an influence did your family have on you, and especially your father, Waisaki? Um, dad, Dad's always um, helped me out heaps, and um, just with anything, to be honest. Like, he was pretty, uh, he, he wasn't trying to force me to play rugby. That was the main thing, I think, for me, and um, didn't feel too much pressure, especially um, him being a rugby player himself. So he's just supportive, and you know, just try to help me out in whatever way possible. Does he still try and coach you and help you out with some things? Uh, yeah, he does. Um, back in the day when I used to play in the backs, he, he'd usually help me out. But um, now since I'm in the fours and he'll try and tell me, I'll be like, oh, you, you're a back, you don't know. But <laughs> Stay in your lane. Yeah, then. yeah, exactly. But no, nah, it's all right. Um, let's talk about that then. So what position were you playing in the back line? And you must have been seriously the biggest back <laughs> to have been playing high school rugby. Oh, I was actually, I think I was, told I was pretty skinny back in the day but um, uh, yeah I started off playing on the wing back younger uh, younger days and then when I was about 16 I moved into the forwards but yeah and when I was 17 I was in and out uh, forwards and backs uh, playing for 15 but then yeah year 13 that's when I was just straight forwards all the way. Yeah. Did you enjoy the glory that comes with being a winger because we all know they love it right Jeff? Yeah, um, I don't know, there was a few, I think there was a couple of tries, but um, it was alright, I guess. Um, those are all the shiny guys, all the pretty faces in that, but it's all good being in the forwards. So what do you prefer about playing in the forwards then? And is number eight, is that your favoured position? Um, yeah, number eight or number six, I don't really mind as long as I'm sort of just playing, but um, I just like the forwards because you get the, uh, your hands on the ball a lot more. Yeah, it's a bit more... Uh, Confront confrontation. Let's talk about last weekend then, being you and getting to start for the first time. What did that feel like? Um, yeah, I got a lot of um, chat throughout the week from the coaches and that. They were just telling me to do what I've done sort of all year, just try and get my hands on the ball. And um, yeah, every opportunity I get, just try and do, do what I do sort of thing. So it was uh, quite good to get that because I was, I was um, able to be confident going into the game, especially with uh, getting that start. So. How does that first sort of 30 minutes feel when you're on that field and everything's just going right? Um, it was it was pretty uh, it was pretty uh, cool seeing, especially on Richie just just cut some dudes up there. That was, <laughs> it was I was pretty funny, but um, no, it's just mean like just sort of um, scoring try after try and having the ball roll like that and just. I don't know, the ABs do, do what the ABs do sort of thing, so yeah, it was pretty cool. And the Bledisloe Cup traditions, first time you were able to get your hands off the trophy and I don't think you put it down. What was it like drinking the beer out of it and what were the celebrations like after? Yeah, well, just um, the vibes in the change room were just like amazing, like everyone was just happy, yeah, was just filling up the filling up the Bledisloe and then taking that drink was uh, just something uh, I'll never forget. Well, with that baritone tabs and the yep. Fiji inside, he'd be out the back doing the doing the deep voices, wouldn't he? Well, what a voice! <laughs> I know, unbelievable. But what I'm interested in is, we said on Saturday night at the Test match, he probably wasn't as visual, right, as we've normally seen in ball carrying. Mm. But we also thought, geez, had a good game. So when you're analysing players, what what do you actually look at from a whole? Yeah, and I think that's. The thing about analytics is it's answering a question that you want to know about players or a group of players. So what did we find him. out about Hoskins on the weekend? I mean, Well, he had a really balanced game, didn't he? And I think that's one of the things the All Blacks like. At the next level, at super level, he does lots of things really, really well. He doesn't have, he doesn't have any major failings. That sounds like a negative way of looking at it, but at test level, it's about being consistent across all parts of the game. 
Yeah, and his role. I mean, that's what we're sort of talking yeah. about. There's this balance and is the roles that he actually creates. And th this is why, you know, when coaches look at a game, you often, you know, say a guy's a complete player because they're often doing the, you know, the hard work off the cameras. Yeah. And so that's what you really want to look at, Tabs, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So, we're talking ball carries, we're talking offloads, the fact that that picture. And, and a lot of the statistics we're talking about in the analytics are about how those plays as well go on and affect the scoreboard. And that's yeah. an important part of the way you look at the game, right? Absolutely. Often when we look at uh, his raw stats from the game, they either don't make, not, not that they don't make sense, but it, like, it actually doesn't tell you how he plays. But what we want to know about players is, does like here, for example, does he have an impact on the scoreboard by either passing it to a player who uh, creates a scoring opportunity or maybe... Um, uh, in an offload situation. Because here's the situation here. I mean, the fact that obviously the Wallabies' attack wasn't that great, so he, he made his tackles, he yeah. did what he needed to do. Just six carries in the game, but it's just one try assist, one turnover. But all of those things behind the scenes that he is doing, and he was impressive through the course of, of Super Rugby Aotearoa. And we're going to take a little bit of a comparison about one of his teammates, and we're going to do that. Now this, now this here is a lot of information, but... Really important, the fact you're talking about expected points added. And here are all these stats between him and Akira Ioane. And run us through sort of some of how these numbers work and what they actually represent. And I'll reiterate it again. It's about when they do something with a ball, whether it be a ball carry, an offload or a pass, does it actually put a player into a position to score? And it's a different way of looking at the, the game uh, and analysis, but it actually reflects in the scoreboard. So a lot of our analysis actually doesn't reflect in the scoreboard. This does... And, and so you'll those see are your all points, right? So those are yeah. points. You've got minutes played, obviously, but metres, they're all, all about over the course of a, a campaign. And this is the interesting thing, where you've got negative stats. How do you create a negative stat? So you'll see there around penalties conceded. So when he gives away penalties, does it actually cost his team points? Minus 2.3, for example. For Akira, 5.2. So when he's giving away penalties, what is the cost to the team on a scoreboard? But both of those players are positive. They come out on the Absolute, positive yes. side of things. Yeah, I, uh, I hate to do this to you, Tabs, but I actually want to talk about Akira. Yeah. Because last year people said, oh, he's not doing the little things. Even the coaches come out and say, we've got to do this. So you've been studying these guys for two years. You know how good Hoskins is. But, but is that the big difference that you've seen on the stats with Akira? I think Akira, that, that whole Blues loose forward trail were outstanding in this, um, this super campaign. And you can see that in the numbers. And Hoskins was ranked third. So Hoskins is up there as well, but Akita had probably one of his best campaigns ever. And the reason he's probably back in the All Blacks, and I'm sure he'll be knocking the door for the Brisbane game. So well, you mean think about the course, of, and people are going, well, those numbers seem small, but when you start thinking about a context of 15 players on the field and yeah. another eight players, the cumulative, isn't it? The yes. fact that affect. But once again, it gives you the opportunity, opportunity to ask questions about yeah. a player and going, wow, the impact they're having or the negative impact they've been having, and does that become a coaching tool? Absolutely it does. So when you're looking at a player, often your gut feel, and you know, we talk about gut feel all the time, you often is, is really accurate. What this does is confirm that or throws a flag at a part of the game you didn't realise. So this is this is my next question. So I am you, the you forward so coach. Sorry, your yeah, coaching. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this could have saved your exactly. career. Could have yeah, saved exactly. your career. <laughs> so and mine as well. I, I'm, the, I'm the forward coach, yeah. right? Um, Frizzell is not stacking up on all of those stats, mm. but he's the best line-out jumper. Am I coming to the selection meeting with Foxy <laughs> and Fozzie and saying, this is why we I need, need line-out? We need him in the team. And I think that's always the balance when you're putting together a, uh, an all-black team or whatever team you're putting together, is the numbers paint a picture. They might rank players for you, but it's, it's also... Uh, and you'll have this with your assistants. The, the, the defence coach wants to have Papali'i in his team, the attack coach wants to have Frizzell in his team. And so that's the balance there. The line-out coach definitely wants Hoskin in his team. And that's one of the reasons he's going to be such an important all black because he's a great line-out exponent. Do you see balance, right? So I always talk about loose forward balance. Can you see that in the analytics? Like, for example, the other day, I thought that, you know, Frizzell played a tight game, Hoskins was a bit of a mix, and the week before, you know, you've seen some guys playing tight, some guys playing loose. Do you see that in the analytics? You definitely do. You definitely do, because it's about their impact. And I think that's the thing. It's just not a raw number. He made five rucks or he didn't go to five rucks. Actually, does this player have an impact? And it's a, it's a different way of looking at it. And I think for a lot of people, it'll be strange, but we'll talk about it in the coming weeks. Well, the people at home have always got their own voice, and the Rugby Pass fans' voice was brought to you by the All Blacks' new sponsor, Healthspan Elite. Powering the fans' voice. Brought to you by Healthspan Elite, the official sports nutrition partner for the All Blacks. Have we got one more question? 
Well, there's plenty to talk about and plenty to debate, and of course, changing faces. He's got more questions. No, just it's one. Not, well, it's not going to fix everything. We've just got one. one. One more. What do you got? Is it true that we need the, the scrum? Because the Fords oh. are. Oh. <laughs> You've got to have a good scrum <laughs> to win a football game. It's a scourge of a game, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a of a That's, game. Bring on another Lowy. back. Bring Hold on another Lowy. back onto it. Let's take it the question from you at home, though, and what you want. To know, and this is what it was. Have the All Blacks unearthed the Ford firepower to match it with the likes of England and South Africa up front? 61% of you said yes, 39% of you said no. Let's debate that. But the fact we've talked about the likes of Hoskins and Tutu, Akira Iwani getting better, but that physicality we're talking about, Patrick Tupolotu Mills, you look about the players that the All Blacks have started to develop. Do you like what you're seeing? And then as in comparison, let's talk about it, because the big boppers, England and South Africa, two teams that went on to play in last year's Rugby World well, Cup. Well, we won't get a comparison until we play those teams, but I like the way they're sort of tracking it about it. You've got some very young guys, a new breed of guys that are actually come through, and they've been exposed as well under, under a bit of pressure. So I like the fact that they're, they're actually starting to... I mean, we've just spoken about Hoskins and the way he's turned out, the balance of his game right across the board and he's come off the bench he's had to think about sort of the mentality of coming off the bench but also balance it out when he comes down to the field so I think I think they have Patrick Tupolotu for me has stepped up big time in terms of the physicality so I like the way they, they, they're tracking it's hard to get a comparison you know with the likes of England and that until you play them Tabs I don't want to talk about this too much but you're involved in a Super Rugby campaign down with the Chiefs mm -hmm. and it was a difficult season but you guys were very very close how much do you think that competition in particular prepared these guys for the next level? Yeah, I think unbelievably well. You're only as good as your competition, so if you're locking horn, horns every weekend with unrelenting opposition, uh, teams that know you really well, so you've got to adjust every weekend, it can only forge a stronger and stronger team. And I think the All Blacks, to choose from a group that's been basically battered around for 10 weeks, um, is reflecting in the matchup. you know, for the last three weekends. Are we making, are we closing that gap? Because we talked about it, I know John Plumtree, and Greg Feek talked about getting some of that intimidation factor, the fact that physicality in their Ford pack. Given we've only played Australia three times, the fact, though, do you see some improvements, JK? Yeah, we're heading in the right direction, but I think Foster comes out and says, we are picking Dupali Karifi for physicality. We're waiting for Frizzell to morph into Jerome Kaino. Against England and South Africa, you have to have someone that the opposition are going, whoa, not going to run down his lane, right? Did we have that in the last World Cup? Possibly not. Do we need it? Yes. And I think, you know, from all the voices coming, there's some amazing loose fours that have been mm. left at home. We know that, right? But they are looking for physicality. And if Frizzell says, I want to be that man, he's got to keep improving that as well. And you talk about Papali earlier on, you talk about Cullen Grace, you yeah. were talking about it. We've got young guys, though, who are ready to step up to the fold. But also, we're not having to sacrifice, Mills, for me, some of that experience. Well, we've still got guys like Artie Sabir. We've still got guys like Sam Kane who are there. Sam Whitelock, Dane Coles picking a fight every chance he gets, every opportunity. That physicality, we need an experience. We st still need to call on that, and that's something other teams don't have. Exactly, and that's a luxury we've got. You know, that you can, you can put a youngster in there with one or two test matches under his belt, but you fill them up with guys that had 50, that have been there, that have been to war with each other, know that experience and feed feed that to them. Australia haven't got that at the moment. You know, when you look at the guys that are making decisions out wide, you know, you know, one test, you know, Lolo Sia being put in the in the I mean him and you know Nick White, it's probably just him. So that's You're the right, luxury. Kafe, there's no problems. If it's Kafe, there's no problems apparently. <laughs> I tell you what, is the, the learning curve for those kids is going to be steep because they're playing every week, not getting the situation where we're getting the opportunity to bring guys in and out. Young guys having to face the all blacks week after week. Mm. They'll have to get better and get better very, very quickly. After break, it's time for us to look back at our domestic game, but on the home front we can always look forward to some motorsport uh, motorsport and this is the battle of jack's ridge
congratulations to Canterbury in the FPC final, but oh my Waikato, so close, so close. Uh, the Mighty 10 Cup has two rounds remaining, though week nine this weekend. What is clear is that the Premiership is still wide open, all teams, all teams in with a mathematical chance of sneaking into the playoffs. But what's not clear is if Canterbury's going to be amongst it. Check this out. They are sitting at the rear end of the bus, right down the bottom, with still Tasman and Auckland to play. Those are the top two teams in the competition. So if Harbour hangs in there against Counties Monaco this weekend, the Red and Blacks, they may find themselves in the unique position. I say unique because they've never been there before, dropping down to the championship division. And they've never, never been in the championship division before. Imagine that, some red and black there. Uh, you never, you never want to be the last on the table, uh, yet still to face the top teams in the competition, relying on others to lose to save your uh, bacon. Do you? No, thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to a rematch of Targo Hawks Bay. I'm still dark about that. Let it go. Yeah. No, I, well, let you, it let, go, oh, Elsa. No, I, there's a lot of things I can't <laughs> let go. I tell you what, if you're a Canterbury uh, supporter though, team, so You'd be worried. Very, yeah. very... Why are you smiling? Why are you so... to stand up to see them at the bottom of the... <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 oh! Oh! Hey, hey, I've been hey. waiting a long time. We've <laughs> got two games to go. We don't want to give them any ammunition, Mills. But the fact of the matter is, this is Canterbury. This is a team exactly. that wins multiple titles, back to back. But I think this is an indication this year of how even this competition truly is across both division, cross matches, whatever you saw in the end on any given weekend, a team could win. And you think about the likes of Taranaki struggling, struggling their way through this competition. But can Canterbury survive? Well, I think they've, they've certainly had history to be able to survive. I think um, you know they've, they've definitely got players here, the coaching staff as well, for me and their experience. And you, you, you touched on it. You know, that's, that's what will give them comfort, the fact that this competition is, is so tight. You've got teams from the Championship beating um, you know, uh, teams from the Premiership. So, I mean, can they do it? Of course they can. No. <laughs> no they can't do it. I think, well, they've I think got Tasman said, and Auckland to finish. They've got Tasman yeah, and Auckland exactly. to finish. And it doesn't Tasman get any harder than that. And we've said, we've said often that this is, a, this is a sprint. I mean, I think, um, you know, we can laugh about it, but, you know, proud... Proud union, they'll be looking at themselves and saying, if anyone can actually come back and do it, Canterbury can. You know, they could get up and win it. They've done it before. But I just think it, it's about confidence, Mills. And and you're right, Jeff. You know, when you think about our All Black side, we've got 40 guys over there, and yet we've got, you know, some fantastic rugby going on in this country. So the the, the depth that we had, you know. And then how players can come back into size, like a Nasi Manu comes back into the Otago mm. side, um, Jamie McIntosh playing in blue and gold. Uh, the fact that those players coming back, Mills, you had a bit more experience to the talent, and all of a sudden you see a different level of, I suppose, um, professionalism, preparation, some consistency in performances. But when we've traditionally seen some drop-off, I don't, I don't think we're seeing that drop-off now because they're all recognising, you know what, we're going to go to win a couple of games. We make the playoffs. Exactly. Two games and we've got a title, whether it be a premiership or championship. Oh, there's no doubt the game's changed in, in terms of the speed of it, the physicality in there. But when you bring back those, those experienced guys to share those, um, you know, I suppose that experience that they've had over the years, all it does, it, it just flourishes the, the rest of the team. So you talk about those sort of guys. And now the competition's actually evened itself out, which is... Is what we wanted, isn't it? Uh, line out drives on the weekend for games. You know, you talk about it happened uh, down in the uh, FPC final, but uh, Hawks Bay and Bay of Plenty going at it, getting down. I mean, we saw some really tight finishes, and there's a desperation amongst these players as well now. And I, I just see teams getting better and better. Have we still? We had Tasman on front, right out the top. Yes. We looked at their squad, but all of a sudden they have three or four key All Blacks. The squad looked great, but a few key guys go out of it. Like I say, Auckland looking really strong. Celestia Riasi. And how dangerous is it? We talk about some of the talent we've got, JK. Yep. Hey. Good Maris man too. You should have stayed at the Blues. Went down <laughs> to the Hurricanes. But anyway, God I mean, might forgive him. We'll see. Wait and see. But, I mean, really, really talented. Absolutely great on his feet. He's a little bit like Talia with a bit more size. Fast, got great uh, evasion. And I like he's a little bit cocky, you know. He gets up, has a little bit of a dance mills. Hey, if we were to, you might have been allowed to do that. No, we no way I'd be dancing. I can't move these hips like yeah. that. Mate. But he's athletic, you know. I mean, getting up and he's got a massive left boot as well. So in terms of um, the talent coming through, isn't it good? The Waikato women were unlucky, you'd have to say. Can the Waikato men, have they just been sneaky? 
just through this where they've just gone about business, but then you watch the experience. Uh, you know, Liam Messam floating around the, the brand of rugby that they're playing, you know. Um, can some of that experience? Adam Tonson, what is he, 37 years old, still running out there and doing it right, you know. To me, you can't underestimate the fact that when you've got momentum, when you are playing well, and they are playing well, you've only got to ride that for another month. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where you're talking about the Canterbury side. You know, they haven't, they've sort of they've lost a bit of confidence ever since they've lost the Shield. You look at a Wakato team and you've got an experience there and they're winning game after game. But also that, that experience amongst the young fellas, you know, now they're, they're starting to sort of step up to the mark as well. So they're, they're going about their business in a good way. Bay of Plenty, three on the trot. We're looking average, then boom, beat Canterbury. Won the last couple, beat the Bay on the weekend, playing some really good footy. Well, the Battle of the Bay, that hurts. Ooh. That hurts for some people that we know. But in the end, we've got great action coming up this weekend. We shouldn't forget, though, this is an all-black test match against the Wallabies. Mills, are you going to be with us? You're saying. You're joining the team. Tabai will be back as well in the war room to prepare ourselves. JK, are you going to be nervous this weekend? You were nervous last weekend. Are you nervous this weekend? Well, I really sincerely hope that the Australian side bounces back and play incredibly well and only get pumped by 20. <laughs> <laughs> well, plenty of confidence from Sir John Kerr and Mills will be back. Bernie will be here as well. Can't wait to bring you all the action on a Saturday night. It's been great to be with you once again here on The Breakdown. We will see you in seven days. Set to go for Bledisloe 3, a must-win game for the Wallabies. No, big pressure on tonight, like there always is. Trouble here. I've got numbers out wide, but he backs himself, the big man. Change of direction. Change of pace. The fly half is flying. Oh, that is good. Individual brilliance. What a run this is. Magic moment. Wallaby's on the charge and on David. So pass yeah. into a gap. Try. Satutu goes off the back and Yuani scores. That's simple. Moong a flat to Barrett. Straight through, straight out. Sprint. Johnny Barrett. Oh. They defend the Blitters. Here we go. You know, decompress tomorrow and, and we go again for next week.